Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this short game to the com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with NVIDIA's GTX 1070 Ti, specifically on overclocking and how overclockable this new graphics card is going to be. Hint, quite overclockable indeed. Then move over to Mobile Ryzen. Benchmarks have leaked online, which paints a very good picture for the next... Uh, generation APUs and finally we'll finish with PCI SIG because they have finalized the specifications of the next iteration of PCIe known as 4.0 of course but first a small bit of administration slash news on the channel you might recall that we do actually have a Ryzen Threadripper motherboard and processor uh, yes that's the 1950X now we've actually done all the photography for it but I've not yet started the benchmarks. And there's a reason behind that. We were supposed to be getting a GTX 1080 tie. I say supposed to be because there's a bit of a hiccup. Uh, I can't give you the specifics because there's an investigation currently going along. But basically, it's pretty much that the delivery company, who I cannot name, has stolen the review sample. So MSI are going to be sending out a replacement to us. And yes, they're not too happy. But, um, hey, it unfortunately happens. And apparently it's not the first time that this uh, delivery company has actually stolen items from MSI. The stuff the reviewers go through, ladies and gentlemen. Anywho, so, GTX 1070 Ti. So, you might recall one of the prolific and consistent rumours with the 1070 Ti, slash TI, if you prefer, is that it boasts locked frequencies. Now I say locked frequencies in a very loose term because as we all know GPUs now have of course boosting which means that a clock speed of like 1600 megahertz just for the sake of argument might boost to 17 or even 1800 megahertz assuming power and uh, heat and the rest of the uh, you know caveats are not coming into play. However, you do have the option, of course, of modifying the clock speed. So, for example, you could crank an extra 100, 200 megahertz on your particular graphics card. So, for example, the 1080s might go to, let's say, for the sake of argument, the low 2 gigahertz to 2.1, something like that. But the rumors were that the 1070 Ti slash Ti were locked, and this would not be the case. In other words, what you got is pretty much down to NVIDIA's discretion. But that's not going to happen. At least fully. And this is where things get a bit complex. So you can modify them. In other words, if you were to rush out, buy a 1070 tie, pop it into your rig, you could load up MSI Afterburner or whatever application you choose to, and crank the clocks up to whatever you desired. This is where it gets weird, though. Apparently... The board partners themselves cannot do this. That's right. They've actually been essentially told by NVIDIA that you cannot modify the BIOS. So, in short, it's going to be just reference clock speeds. And different partners are not going to be able to uh, offer different clock speeds based upon what they are comfortable guaranteeing. Okay. There is one slight exception, and that is Eve, uh, sorry, Asus. So Asus actually do offer a guarantee clock speed of around 80 MHz at 1759 with a base clock of 1683. So why can they do that? Well, it's very simple. You're using a GPU tweaking app. So in other words, you have to physically go in, tweak it, of course, that's not particularly difficult. It's just a couple of clicks. Overclocking is nowhere near as challenging, unless you're really pushing to get the most out of your card. It's nowhere near as difficult as it once was. However, other manufacturers are, and this is reported, by the way, by videocards.com, are also listing frequencies of what they feel is achievable with their particular GPU. For example, EVGA lists a card as running at 1607 with 1683 megahertz plus obviously plus being the imperative part about this this is essentially saying yeah you're not getting that if you just plonk the card into the system what you are getting is a guarantee that 
Under normal scenarios, in other words, if your power supply is capable and you're not running this in a furnace, you will be able to achieve those clock speeds. Zotac also are advertising the GPU with factory tested overclocks and they're saying that their card is capable of squeezing an extra 200 megahertz on the memory and 150 megahertz on the actual GPU core. A couple of thoughts. One, obviously memory speeds are going to be the most imperative, very important, because this card from what obviously I don't have a sample at the moment, probably will get one pretty soon, but from what I understand it's going to definitely be memory bandwidth constrained. Translation, it's probable that at lower resolutions, 1920 by 1080, 1440p, that type of thing, um, you're probably going to get most scenarios where the GPU is not really bandwidth constrained. You're probably going to find that it's often fill rate or perhaps even CPU constrained. However, as uh, levels of anti-aliasing start to increase or whatever, then obviously memory bandwidth becomes more of the concern. So this is going to be very interesting. I would be curious eventually if there's going to be nine GPS modules that are plon plonked onto this, considering you can get 1060s with it, so I wouldn't be surprised. Final for on the NVIDIA thing, I don't necessarily like this move, and it uh, you can interpret it, and I'm not saying it is, but you could certainly interpret it as uh, NVIDIA trying to push the Founders Edition cards. I have a feeling this might upset uh, AIBs, but hey, is what it is. I'm going to be curious to know why this is. If I had to take one guess, and this is less conspiracy theory, one of the reasons I can see them doing this is quite simple. Because it would cannibalize a lot of the GTX 1080 Founders Edition sales. And this card, to be honest, is much better spec than what I ex uh, what I anticipated. I, I kind of expected it to have um, be closer to the original rumors, perhaps 256 fewer CUDA cores than what it ended up being. But hey, it is what it is. And really, with only 128 fewer CUDA cores, it is basically a 1080. Next piece of news, and this is with the mobile Ryzen's. This is not going to be a full analysis because, to be honest, we're looking at the uh, APUs being quite close to launch at this point anyway, so I'll probably do one then. But hey, Acer have launched a new Swift Free Notebook, which features the KB Lake R, uh, sorry, the KB Lake R, R processor, as, and this also includes the GeForce MGX150. And there are actually a couple of benchmarks which have popped up. This is from Geekbench, uh, Geekbench 3 to be precise. And these show off the 2700U versus multiple uh, different other uh, CPUs. And uh, well, most imperatively, most importantly, excuse me, you're looking at the i7-8550U versus the 2700U. The 2700U, for those who haven't uh, seen uh, Amy's video yesterday, has the following specifications, four cores, eight threads, that's one that's CCX. Of course, this is based upon the Ryzen architecture. 2.2 gigahertz base clock, boosting up to 3.8 gigahertz. 10 Radeon RX Vega CUs. Uh, these run, by the way, up to 1300 megahertz. Level one is uh, cache is 64 kilobytes with uh, instruction, uh, 32 kilobytes for data, 512 kilobytes per core of level two. And finally, level three cache, is four megabytes shared and this perhaps is most important it runs at 95 watts uh, sorry 25 watts up to but the average is just 15 watts and does indeed support dual channel memory one thing you'll notice is that amd's own official marketing slides <laughs> i don't kind of like the way they did this but it is what it is uh, for cinebench if you're using cpu rendering um, they have the 2700U against 6700, uh, sorry, 7600, God, I cannot speak today, which is obviously the 7th uh, generation. However, with the other benchmarks where you see POV Ray, PC Mark, TrueCrypt, and so on, that's where you have a much better spread of uh, processors. And in Time Spy, unsurprisingly, the 2700U absolutely stomps the Intel uh, equivalents. Finally, PCI SIG. So this, of course, is PCI 4.0 uh, specification. And what do we have? Well, pretty much what most of us had expected. We're looking here at double the memory bandwidth of PCIe 3. 
Now, for some level of context, don't forget that the original specification of PCIe 1.0 was introduced some time ago. It was actually introduced back in 2003. And for graphics cards, we started to see the phasing out of AGP, which itself had uh, taken over the original uh, specification of PCI. So we saw PCIe then accelerated graphics. Then, of course, PCIe came back in. And then... Um, PCIe 2.0 was introduced in 2006. Uh, currently, we're at 3, which is um, actually pretty old now. It's 7 years old. Actually, almost coming up to 8 years old. It was introduced back in 2010. So we're looking at a total bandwidth, time 16, of course, at 64 gigabytes per second, with the standard of PCIe 5 uh, operating at up to 128 gigabytes per second when, finally, it's introduced. So why did it take so long? Well, one of the reasons behind this is that the, they felt that basically there was enough bandwidth as was when it came to GPUs. Um, but over the last couple of years, as we're starting to see compute workloads become more consistent, as we start seeing the introduction of NVMe devices, as we start seeing multiple graphics cards become normal, and of course the... the multiple CPU cores now running and pushing huge amounts of data over uh, for games and of course as resolutions start to increase and texture sizes start to increase you get the idea basically PCIe 3 just was no longer able to cut it and therefore introducing a faster um, standard was the only way forward one of the other benefits for this and this is actually a kind of side benefit is adding additional PCIe lanes to motherboards of it or, and uh, CPUs as well definitely increase the uh, cost expenditure. This is one of the reasons, of course, that uh, Intel um, and obviously also segmenting the market share, and this is one of the, one of the main complaints with the X299 platform, especially when you start looking at like the uh, 7820 versus like the 7900 and how the uh, 44 PCIe lanes versus the 28 PC PCIe lanes, excuse me, and how people were complaining an awful lot. Well, obviously, if you have uh, a large amount of memory bandwidth, even with fewer uh, lanes total, then you can start alleviating issues, even if you don't have a larger total number of lanes available. In other words, if you can have, let's say... 16 general purpose lanes from the CPU and another four for this chipset. If you have 16 which run at 64 gigabits per second, even if you half that, that means you're 32, which essentially means it's uh, not exactly the equivalent, but you know, in general terms, you could almost look at it as more than sufficient to running a couple of cards in like Crossfire or perhaps even once again putting an NVMe in there or whatever you need to do. The only caveat, and this is perhaps a bit of a kick in the shin is that PCIe 5 is not going to be too long in the future. You're saying, well, when's not too long in the future, Paul? Like, are we talking 2021, 22 maybe? No. It looks like AMD themselves are targeting 2020 for PCIe 4 support. However, the problem is PCIe 5 is being fast-tracked for the standardization to be completed by 2019. Therefore, in theory at least, by the time that we start seeing PCIe 4, it might already be a little bit old. And, well, that's just kind of how it is. So, too long, didn't read. Uh, basically, if you're looking to buy a motherboard right now, don't start feeling bad if you you know, just say, hey, screw it, I'm just going to buy a PCIe 3 motherboard, because A, don't forget they're backwards compatible, B, if you don't have a ton of devices plugged into your system, let's say you've just got a single hard drive, which is perhaps taking a lot of bandwidth, let's say a NVMe drive, or perhaps even a couple of just SATA hard drives, and on top of that, you're running a single graphics card, even if it's a Vega 64 or a GTX 1080, or perhaps even a bit faster, to be honest, you're probably going to be okay with memory bandwidth for the foreseeable future. With that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.